I want to thank um, the MC, um, thank the Dean, Dr. Franceschi, who is gone. And it's great to see uh, all of you here. Um, we've known each other for a long time. Um, we've worked together um, for this country. We have struggled together. So it's great to see comrades in the struggle uh, in the building. So I thank you very much for that. It's often the case that um, when a political moment arises, people become exuberant. And in their exuberance, they tend to be irrational and tend to make more of certain moments than they should. So at the outset, I would just like to caution us to be very, very uh, reserved in our evaluation of the so-called handshake and what the handshake may imply for the future of this country. Uh, that's because, you know, we've seen this movie before. And when we saw this movie before, it did not always turn out to be very fruitful. Um, but I think, you know, our people are depressed. They are despondent. And they are unhappy. And, you know, they also hate each other. And so anything that appears to be a ray of hope is inflated manifold. So my first uh, comment here is to urge caution about what has happened. Because really, um, it's kind of a mystery. Um, when we talk about Kenya's political developments, um, it behooves us to put those developments um, in a context of history, both legal, political, economic, and social. Um, and to ask ourselves, indeed, where have we come from, who we are, and where we are going. And in the context of that canopy, large canopy, um, then try to pick out certain moments, like a handshake, and see where the handshake fits in that broader you know, canvas. So states themselves are creatures of violence. They are brought into being by violence, and they are maintained by violence. Um, but you know, there is violence that is legitimate, and there is violence that is illegitimate. There is power that is legitimate, and there is power that is illegitimate. Um, our challenge as a country is to understand why we have failed in the project of nation building why this creature of violence called the state that is maintained by violence has failed to function optimally. You know, um, I don't think that I tell you anything that you do not know when I say that, you know, I think of Kenya as a quasi failed state. I think of Kenya as a quasi failed state. See, you can have a country, you can have a state, you can have a regime, you can have a government, you can have all those four things, but you may not have a nation. And if you do not have a nation, your state, your regime, your government, your country will mean very little to the people who inhabit uh, that country. We don't often think seriously about this question. You know, we don't. 
But I submit to you that one of the most important things for us to think about is to think about that question whether we are a nation. And to ask ourselves, and to honestly look each other in the eye and say to ourselves, if we are not a nation, why are we not a nation? But even perhaps to ask whether we can become a nation. Okay? Of course, a country is simply a mass of geography. Animals could live in it. Okay? A state is the normative instrumentality that superintends the state. A government runs that state, or a regime for that matter. But a nation is something different. A nation is a collection of individuals who have forged together a common destiny and a common identity based upon the wisdom of their history, the accumulated wisdom of their history. Okay? Now, you know, that wisdom does not have to be pristine. It, it, it's often painful, and it's often forged in the anvil of violence sometimes, and in, in the struggle. But at the end of the day, that history is supposed to give you a discernible identity that defines you as different from all other nationals of other states. So that when you say you are Kenyan, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to define Kenya as an idea. Not as a geographic location. You have to define Kenya as an idea. And I often ask people, Kenyans, you know, when I'm feeling bad, to tell me what Kenya is and whether they can define that country called Kenya, not as a land mass in East Africa or in Africa, but as an idea. And I say so because and I shouldn't be held accountable for this, but I'll say it anyway. Most stable and advanced democracies have a sense of their countries as ideas. You know, it's not always coherent. And it's not always uh, completely agreed upon because the nation building project is a dynamic project. It's always changing. But most advanced democracies have an idea of who they are. Okay? Not as the US, the landmass, not as Japan, the landmass, but an idea of who they are. So that they can distinguish themselves from all others. And it is from that idea that you forge a national consciousness and then you forge what are called national interests that can be defended. And those national interests can be internal, you know, they can be external. But you forge them that way. Okay, and there's a spectrum. There should be a spectrum of those which are sort of the agreed uh, national interests among the elites and among the general population. Even though at the fringes, you know, there could be other ideas. So, given that understanding, it is my view that the African post-colonial state, for the most part, and the African post-colonial state is, is more unique than other post-colonial states elsewhere. The deep reach of European normative ideas into Africa 
the disorganization of pre-existing African societies, the dismantling of the notion of, of, the notion of self-worth, left a lot of us on this continent and moored. It is not something that we should make light of. And I'm not saying that people who say, you know, people look at you and they say, well, you know, you can't keep on blaming the white man. You know, I'm not going there. Okay? I'm just saying that this is a fact. Our outlook is Eurocentric. Our aspirations are Eurocentric. But we are simply the second rate of the original. We are, in essence, what I call dumb copies of the original. Because we can't be Europeans. So what the heck are we? Dumb copies of the original. That's one of our biggest problems. And that issue there of identity, of the African identity, which is supposed dynamic, has bedeviled us. And the reason for that bedevilment is the nature of the post-colonial state. So I just want to read something to you about the post-colonial state that I would like to uh, you to think about, and the quote comes from um, Lord Salisbury. Lord Salisbury um, was the British Prime Minister in 1890, and this is uh, just after the conclusion of the Anglo-French Convention, which established the spheres of influence in West Africa. And I quote, we have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's foot ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly where the mountains and rivers and the lakes were. End of quote. So, they just took a pencil and a ruler and drew a, a, you know, a, an arbitrary line and called that a country. Hmm? They put us together. We may, have been neighbors, we may have been neighbors before, and we were neighbors, right? Huh? But we were not neighbors in the context of a modern state. They did that for us. And they said, now, you've been put there together. Make it work. So we have been engaged in a process of trying to make it work since 1964. Hmm? And we haven't made it work. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a thin veneer on top of Kenya. You know, among the elites like you and me, where we sometimes fancy ourselves as Kenyans. But that's only because we benefit from the state. You know, if you go down to the village and you ask your grandmother who is a Kenyan, she wouldn't have the foggiest about what you're talking about. No idea what Kenya is. But if you ask her, you know, are you a Kikuyu, you know, eh? she might say she's a Kikuyu from Moranga. Okay? Uh, you ask her to Kitui, you might ask someone there, who are you? And people say, yeah, I'm a Kamba. But this idea of Kenya is not, not natural. Yeah. So, so this submission of our consciousness to the idea of Kenya, that chasm, that gap is there. And we have to think about that gap. Okay. 
But fast forward, we are part of the modern age. We cannot unscramble these states. Hmm? Maybe we can, but I don't think we have, we have the courage to do so. So they're not being unscrambled. They're going to stay, for the most part. Because first of all, the international system wants them to stay. And secondly, our elites have developed possessive interests in these states. Okay? And they want them to stay. So if that is the case, then we must ask ourselves, what, what normative basis are we going to use so that these instrumentalities called African postcolonial states, and Kenya here in particular, can start to serve us? Okay? So the modern, you know, liberals, the, the modern state is liberal status based on two norms that I just want to talk about briefly. Number one, it is based on the notion of formal equality. Of formal equality. That all of us are formally equal. Of course, that's a legal fiction, because we are not. I know you're going to scream when I say that. But we are not equal. It's just a legal fiction. But it's a legal fiction that we cannot get rid of. Because imagine the, the opposite belief, which is that we are not equal. You, wouldn't, you don't want to go there. So you know that we are actually not equal, but the idea of thinking that we are unequal is very bad. So then we embrace this fiction. We embrace this fiction of formal equality as a basis for the state. Okay, so women are equal to men, blacks are equal to, equal to whites, uh, formally equal, but it's a legal fiction, mind you. The second fiction is that fiction of abstract autonomy. That abstractly, we are autonomous. That no one owns me, even if that person is my wife. Even if it's your child, you don't own the child. This is also a legal fiction, because people do own others. But these are the basic building blocks of a political democracy, which are actualized in anti-discrimination and equal protection norms. So if you look at our constitution, for example, that we passed in 2010, if you, if you are to remove these two fictions, the whole thing will collapse in a heap. There'll be nothing left. It's built on those two things, as simple as that. So then the question for us is, as Kenyans, have we submitted ourselves to those two legal fictions? Or do we just pretend that those are the legal fiction or fictions of the modern state and we like them, and we mouth every day we like them, or perhaps we don't know whether those are the legal fictions. Maybe we should. Because I was in Bomas with some of you when we were talking about the liberal constitution. That is a liberal constitution. Okay? So the devil is also in those details. Okay? What, what do those legal fictions also do to you as a state? But that's level two. Level one is to simply to say that I submit myself the liberal project. And you mean it. Yeah? Rule of law, judicial independence, elections based upon universal suffrage, the individual over the community. The individual over the community. Did you know that? That's what we bought in 2010. Okay? The individual is a sacred creature, an individual egoist. Who is out there? All right? Okay? The second phase is to say, let us now try to implement that project. Yeah? I always tell people that, when I speak, I always tell people that if you, for example, um, punch an American child, punch, or take a toy from an American child, the first thing out of, out of the child's mouth is, I will sue you. Yeah. 
because that's a rights-based culture. I'll sue you. But I'll sue you means that some of the courts work. Because otherwise, why would the child be saying, I'll sue you if they go to the court and the judge has been bought off? <laughs> right? But if you punch an African child, what is the African child going to say? The African child is going to say, will, will cry. Hmm? Or if you take the toy, you know, they say, you know, don't do that. But the child, African child, is not going to assert a right. Okay? This, what this shows me, you know, and I've done some work on this. What this shows me is that uh, this process of embracing the liberal tradition has been a very long process, and it is a mile long and an inch deep. Okay? It's a mile long and an inch deep, meaning that it is not deep at all. Okay? So we have a lot of work to do to transform the particular state that we call ours. So if we have this uh, history that I just talked about, um, how are we to understand you know, the handshake? African political class did not take long to jettison the liberal project. Did not take long. Hmm? Local class became myopic, tribalistic, and dictatorial. And there are many, things, there are many reasons for this. But part of, part, of those, part of that set of reasons is some of the things that I just, I just discussed. And we can talk about these in the context of uh, the Q&A. But I just want to go back and say that if you want to follow the genealogy of the rupture of the Kenyan state. If you want to follow the genealogy of the rupture of the Kenyan state, you will go back to the falling asunder of Mze Jomo Kenyatta and Jeremogi Oginga Odinga. That chasm that opened at that moment still bedevils us today. And paradoxically, their two children are still tormenting us. <laughs> Paradoxically, the progeny is still exerting this influence over us. But exactly what did Odinga and Kenyatta fall asunder over? Was it personal ambition? Was it um, uh, ethnic chauvinism? What was it? And I put it to you that I think those early founding fathers initially fell out with each other over ideology, which is something that we don't see today. I mean, we see it in the human rights movement because we are cause people. We believe in causes. But these are charlatans called politicians. Don't, don't believe in that. Okay. But these founding fathers fell apart or fell out over this question. I don't want to overstate the ideological fallout because I think we, we, we might be carried away to think it was bigger than it was. But it was, this was the basic deal. Jeromogi Oginga Odinga represented a particular faction of the emerging Kenyan elite that wanted a, a center-left state. Basically, a center-left state, a kind of, a, um, I wouldn't call it a thick welfare state, I'll just call it a kind of a welfare state that could be more embracing and more caring of the population. That's what he wanted. And if you look at the people around him, you know, Birat Kagia and others, you, you will see, you know, that particular legacy. And that was also the legacy, by the way, of the Mau Mau. Okay? It's the same legacy. And then on the other hand, you know, you had Mr. Jomo Kenyatta who want, and this group who wanted a center-right state. And that was the chasm, the essential chasm that developed. 
And if you go back now, you know, through the history of KPU and all the others to the present day, you are going to see this divergent, even to this day, this divergent sort of streams of consciousness within the Kenyan polity. I know when you look at NASA, you don't think that. Because NASA is, uh, is also as many people from Khan. But the, the, the basic center of gravity of NASA is Odinga. It is not the other guys. The other guys are there for the ride. <laughs> Because, you know, they believe that he would take them to Canaan. You know, not the Canaan that the citizen is talking about, but the feeding trough. The feeding trough. So they are there. But he himself, I have no doubt that he is, and, and I know he's been criticized, has this, carries his father's legacy, political legacy. Okay? I have no doubt about that, about the man. I think, you know, you know he's fallen off the wagon many times. But, you know, he falls off the wagon and picks himself up and finds his true north. Eh? He finds his true north. <laughs> he says, you know, calls up to his dad. Dad, I was lost. Now I'm found. Okay? Now, the problem is that the center-right coalition or fraction of the elite that has governed Kenya since independence is deeply entrenched in our state. It reproduces itself very well. It incubates. It incubates. And that is why great minds and great politicians who may come from the center left, like Martha Karua, who is sitting here, does not of, often find favor within the state. Okay? Remember how shocked we were when Dr. Willy Mutunga became the Chief Justice? We said they must have been smoking something. To, <laughs> you know, uh, to make him Chief Justice. And I, I, I was pinching my, I could not believe it. I said, my, 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 they lost it. <laughs> okay? So, so there have been these, you know, Episodic breaks in the system where even a mother Karua becomes something, even a William Mutunga becomes something. But they're episodic. Very quickly they shut the door and they send us home. Very quickly. So, in spite of Mr. Odinga's and parallel uh, political skills, he has been unable to lead the center left elites to power in Kenya. His father failed. He failed. Many people believe that he won the 2007 elections. At least I do. <laughs> you know, I think the 2013 election was a sham. And I think the 2017 contest stunk. They just stink. Because you cannot have an election that is disputed by more than half the country and call it legitimate. Yeah? And of course, uh, the so-called international partners then embrace that election. Shame on them. <laughs> hmm? But in all these cases, in all these cases, Mr. Odinga has failed to wrest you know, power from the center-left elite. It is in this context that um, you know, I want now just to think a little bit about the handshake. Um, first of all, I think that the 2017 elections were probably a last for Mr. Odinga as a candidate. They were a last for Mr. Odinga as a political candidate. I believe that. Which means that the center left has lost its champion. Okay? So one of the things that we have to think about is who is going to occupy that spot. Because, you know, ideas don't just run themselves. Ideas are run through people. 
right? Flesh and blood. If Mr. Odinga retires, do you think that, that the other three NASA individuals, either collectively or individually, have the stomach, the courage, and the guts, maybe the boss, but I don't want to be... <laughs> Do you think they can take us to Canaan? Hmm? Can they stand in the breach and do it? And this is where, of course, the challenge now falls on the younger generation to come up with another figure of authority who can fill that space. And I, that is serious. That is perhaps the single largest challenge that civil society, uh, that the people of Kenya face that the very person, the only person who has been pushing against autocracy may be gone from the state, from the political stage. It's very serious. Because then what's going to happen if there's no one else who can carry that mantle, the center-right elite will consolidate itself. Okay? And leave no political space. I think there are people in ODM who are asking Mr. Odinga to run, um, but I think they are doing so for their own selfish reasons. So I think the, the fact that Mr. Odinga is not running again, for me, is the genesis for the handshake. Because the handshake is, the handshake is just a metaphor. Right? It's a metaphor for political engagement. Right? That's what it is. Okay? So it's, it's a genesis for the handshake is this, is, this, is this idea that he won't run again. So I think he's concluded that he, like his father, would just have to be content with leaving a legacy of reform in Kenya because he will not be able to ascend to State House. It sounds like a Greek tragedy. Right? Father, son, and so on. It sounds like a great tragedy, really. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's Sisyphean. You keep on pushing that big rock, and it keeps on hitting you on the head, and you're turning back. Sisyphean. Okay? So I think as a consequence of this, part of his thinking, I believe that he thinks that the best way to secure his legacy as a reformer is to enter into a detente or a rapprochement with Mr. Kenyatta. So I think for him, the rapprochement and the detente are not personal as such. They may come with personal benefits, but they're not personal. You don't reach 70 years of age, having struggled for so long, and even served 10 years in detention, and then all of a sudden, you betray that whole legacy. So I reject the notion that Mr. Odinga has become a betrayer. I reject that. I don't see that. Now, it does not mean that he won't be betrayed, you know, he may not be a betrayer himself, but he could be betrayed by those with whom he has shaken the hand. Okay? The second thing that we have to think about is what is the nature of the detente? How does it help Kenya cohere into a nation? How does it hook up to the first part of my lecture? This distance that we want to move from from being a country, a state, into a nation? How does it make us a political democracy? How does it do that? Okay? And that is the challenge that we have to think about, and that I'm sure is keeping Mr. Odinga awake. Now, to be clear, Mr. Odinga has entered into this pact by himself with Mr. Kenyatta. Okay, to be sure. 
And you know, I know this for a fact, so don't question me. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other, you know, revolving stars around the major stars are really not part of it. They are strangers to the pact. So Mr. Mudavadi, Mr. Musioka, Mr. Wetangula, uh, he of the recent troubles, uh, you know, I just uh, have not been informed about what's going on. And by the way, neither has Mr. Ruto. Okay. So the question, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is why did Mr. Kenyatta enter into the pact? What is in it for him? And Mr. Kenyatta is not a fool. Okay? He may be other things, but he's not a fool. <laughs> okay? He, Mr. Kenyatta knows that he lacks political legitimacy. He knows that he is not a legitimate leader. That he was not validly elected. He knows this. And he knows this in his brain and in his gut. Huh? He also knows that a large number of Kenyans, perhaps a majority, do not think he is legitimate. So he wants and craves legitimacy. And there's only one person who can give him legitimacy. One. Can you imagine that of all the Kenyans on earth? Only one can give him legitimacy, and that person is Waila Odinga. Okay? Now, uh, you know, someone said, oh, well, because Odinga already shook his hand, uh, Mr. Kenyatta has gotten what he wanted. And to that, like a Russian, I say, yet. Yeah? The handshake has not made him legitimate yet, but what it has done is to provide him with an opening what does Mr. Odinga himself want in return? Does he want simply to be Mr. Kenyatta's golfing mate? <laughs> yeah. Or does he simply want to stand next to Mr. Kenyatta so that they can be seen together? Is it, is it really about that? So I believe that Mr. Um, Odinga needs to do two things. And needs to think along two tracks. But these, but these tracks must meet and meet quickly. Otherwise, they, <laughs> the whole thing will fall apart. You know, with moments like these ones, you must harvest them. Harvest them quickly. Otherwise, the fruits will dry up. So, that, so the two tracks are one track is institutional. It is normative and it is structural. That's one track. Institutional, normative, and structural. This is what must be done to the state to submit it to a democratic order. This is what must be done to the state to make it legitimate. There are structural normative institutional changes that must take place. And you all know them. That is not rocket science. You know them. There are constitutional changes on the structure of the executive. There are changes on devolution. There are changes on corruption, on electoral reforms, and so on. On defanging the tribal state. And perhaps and scrambling the counties. Because I think, first of all, I think for the seven counties it's just too much. Does not make sense. I mean, 47 counties. What a waste. And we've seen that those people are not doing anything with our resources. Okay? So we can have a few. And those counties, by the way, track the tribal districts of the colonial day. So they do nothing but entrench. Uh, ethnic consciousness. So we need to do something different there. You know? But these are questions for debate. Okay? So that 
is the one track that Mr. Odinga must pursue. He must put on the table, pursue on the handshake, a menu of things that might be, might be inedible to Mr. Kenyatta, but a menu that Mr. Kenyatta must eat. It might not be pleasant food to him, but <laughs> you'll have to eat it if this handshake will mean something. And Mr. Odinga cannot retreat from those demands in the context of the handshake. And these demands are the basis for legitimacy. It's a quid pro quo. It's a condition sine qua non for legitimacy. Condition sine qua non. Otherwise, Mr. Odinga walks out and there's chaos again. The second track that Mr. Odinga must pursue is a political track. And the political track must give him political power. Tangible political power. Because there's no way you're going to make these changes that I'm talking about without power. You know? There's no way. You can, you can demand electoral reforms, you can demand changes to the executive without a share of political power through which you can exert leverage and influence and bargaining power. Okay. The question is what kind of, what form that political power is going to take? Is it power within the state? Is it a power sharing arrangement? Is it a unity government? Everything must be on the table. Everything must be on the table. If you get just one side of it, if you get promises for reforms without political power, you've been cheated. You know. So it is not my desire to advocate for coalition government, but I think it is the only solution that can work in this context. And perhaps if, if, if those reforms are made um, and they are deep and abiding, perhaps they will usher in a more palatable 2022 when the electoral cycle comes around. Otherwise, Mr. Odinga will have legitimized Mr. Kenyatta for a song without getting anything in return. He must demand political power. But you know, within the state, political power is a finite matter. It is not infinite. You know, if you look at the Constitution, the political power of the state is finite. It's limited by the people. Because we, the Constitution is a popular sovereignty constitution. Right? So, if you look at the presidency as an executive, where, where will political power come from to give to Mr. Odinga? Will Mr. Kenyatta actually donate his own power to Mr. Odinga? I think not. So I think the political power that Mr. Odinga is going to have to get is going to have to come from Mr. Ruto. Because if you look at the Constitution, I'm serious, I'm not, I'm not joking. If you look at the Constitution, the office of the Deputy President is amorphous. It's an empty shell. It has nothing in it. The Deputy President is a running, is, a, is, a, is an errand boy for the President, if you look at the Constitution. He does what the President tells him to do, and so the President can tell him to do nothing. and give political power to Mr. Odinga. That is one scenario. So I think in my book, the biggest casualty of the, this handshake is Mr. Ruto. 
And I think we may just have seen uh, his ambitions to becoming president in 2022 go up in smoke. I know he's a master strategist, at least he's reputed to be one. <laughs> but even the nine lives of the cat do come to an end. It's unclear to me how he's going to react to this pact. Uh, so in Mr. in Mr. Kenyatta's backyard or within, within Jubilee, my view is that um, the accommodation of Mr. Odinga cannot be done without decapitating Mr. Ruto. He must be decapitated. Politically, I mean. Just to be sure that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that people don't, uh, you know, misinterpret my words. There are other things that could follow. One is that the people of central Kenya are happy again. And they are happy again because Mr. Kenyatta is out of jail. Um, in the context of Jubilee, in the marriage between TNA and URP, Mr. Kenyatta was imprisoned by Mr. Ruto. By embracing Mr. Kenyatta, by, by Mr. Kenyatta and Mr. Odinga embracing, Mr. Odinga has freed Mr. Kenyatta from jail. Mr. Kenyatta does not have to spend sleepless nights at State House because he is worried about Mr. Ruto. What does this mean in turn? This may mean uh, at some point that the Odinga Kenyatta Day tent could lead to the two of them agreeing on a single candidate for 2022. It's a possibility. So perhaps we could see the merging of the elites, the center left and the center right, as a possibility. Okay? And if, in fact, the two of them, in this bromance that now they have, agree on a single candidate for 2022. Who are the likely winners for that sweepstakes? And I give it to you that most likely it's going to be either Mr. Mudavadi or Mr. Musioka or Mr. Gideon Moy. Huh? That, I think those are the likely scenarios here. Unless Mr. Mutunga wants to throw his hat in the ring. <laughs> he says he has been president already. <laughs> but of the Supreme Court, not of the Republic of Kenya. Okay? The reason why I think these are likely uh, compromise candidates is because I don't believe that the people in central Kenya, unless uh, Ms. Karua runs again, which she might, um, I don't think the people of central Kenya will put up a candidate for president in 2022. And I don't even think they will put up a deputy presidential candidate. I don't think so. I think they are going, well, if you look at ethnic politics, the people of central Kenya have been in power, quote unquote, since 2002. How many years is that? 20, will be 20 years. So they're smart guys and girls. So what they are going to do is they are going to look for a president who is not a threat to their political and economic interests. And I think uh, Mr. Musioka, Mr. Mudavadi, Mr. Gideon Moya, benign individuals in that context. I think Mr. Ruto is malignant. <laughs> and, you know, there could be a scenario where Mr. Musioka 
Mr. Mudavadi and Mr. Gideon Moy all form an executive, right? If there is a constitutional amendment to bring back the office of the prime minister, you can, you can have a, a president, a deputy president, a prime minister, among all those three. And then, of course, in that context, Mr. Ruto is neutered, right? He's neutered because the Kalenjins will be able to see themselves in the government. Uh, the Kambas will be there. Um, Mr. Mudawad will be there. The Luos will support this deal because Baba will say so. <laughs> okay? This is just a, it's just a scenario that I'm painting uh, because I'm, you know, we are looking at... Um, Mr. Ruto himself, I think, uh, was, is already... Um, fundamentally left Jubilee, I believe that would be the case, at least in his head, and is now seeking new brides outside Mount Kenya. But it's unclear in my mind where Mr. Ruto will find these brides. Because if there's an ethnic coalition of four of the five groups together, and perhaps more, it's unlikely that he will be requited. The only question there is if Mr. Ruto is shortchanged, uh, what could he do? What would he do? What is he going to do? And that must remain an open question. Because he, while he may not have the power of the state, he may have political power through other means that he can leverage. Okay. So I think the people of central Kenya who live in the Rift Valley huh, ought to be very afraid. <laughs> I'm serious. Because you know the marriage took place in that context. Right? After a brutal, bloody, near genocidal conflict. There is nothing to tell us that that cannot happen again. Nothing. It could just happen again. If Mr. Ruto says I supported you twice and you have jilted me. Of course, he won't be the first Kenyan polit politician to be betrayed. People have been betrayed all over the place. <laughs> Raila was betrayed. Raila's father was betrayed. Kalonzo was betrayed. Betrayals abound. Betrayals are no more in Kenya. So finally, before we go to the Q&A, because I know you're tired and we've, we started late, uh, I'll go back to my nation-building theme and mention several things that I think, even in the context of a handshake, should happen. And these are broad normative ideas that I think we have to think about. Uh, many of you I know are civil society or intellectuals. Um, uh, all partners who believe in these things from other countries. So I think we must return, first we must return to a policy of deliberate nation building. Do the kind of thing that Mwalimu Nyerere did in Tanzania. Actually, do nation building and mean it. Okay? This must mean that we must de-ethnicize the state and de-tribalize our politics. And there are normative tools of doing this, there are legal tools of doing this, there are political tools of doing this. We can do so by creating a culture, a national culture that is national and not ethnic, and by cultivating a national psyche and identity through a shared social, political, and economic vision. The constitution we have is not that bad in that regard. It is not. If, 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 if it was implemented faithfully, it could start to get us there. It's a good document. Second, we must deliberately demarginalize ethnic groups. Deliberately demarginalize ethnic groups. And do so through any and all means, including uh, 
programs for positive discrimination. You know what I mean? Okay? Devolution of power and an equitable distribution of national resources. Third, we must actually create mechanisms for transitional justice. This is a project that is unfinished. The last one was hijacked by Kiplagat. Okay? The late Kiplagat. We cannot pretend that we don't need transitional justice. We do it. We do it for land purposes. We do it for violations of the rights of individuals through murder and pillage and so on. We need it because we are a sick nation. And a sick nation needs therapy. We need it. Okay? When you see people, when you see a you know, suspected thief being beaten to death by normal-looking citizens, what do you think that is? That is fascism. You know, have you seen that happen here? Yes, that is fascism. Where does, where, is, where does such fascism come from? You know, we are a sick nation. That kind of thing cannot happen in a civilized society. It cannot be allowed to happen in a civilized society. That you are beaten to death by a mob. That's called lynching. And you know what lynching meant in the United States? Fourth, I think we should take a second look at our constitution. We've seen what, where the problem, where the problems are. We, we can know how we should be tweaking it and so on. We should look at it again. It's a project. It's an experiment. Let us not be afraid to go back to that document and say that we made some mistakes here and there. Let us look at it again. Okay. And in doing so, let us let us keep our eyes on ethnicity and corruption and the imperial use of power or the imperial abuse of power. Yes. Keep those in our front lobes. Fifth, we have no choice but to continue building a vibrant and independent and effective civil society. Jubilee has tried to kill us but we have refused to die. Okay? And this civil society, might, by the way, must be devoid of ethnic, racial, religious, gender, and other biases. Because I'm, I see some corners of our civil society retarding, uh, getting retarded. It cannot happen. It should not happen. And then six... We should have a, we should foster a new political class. We must incubate a new political class. Because constitutions and states are run by flesh and blood people. Yeah? If you don't have good people running the state, how do you expect for the state to care about its own people? So we must foster this new political class. We must almost engineer this political class. And this political class must be national in outlook and progressive in its international character. Progressive in its international character. Because, you know, Kenya is a village in the context of the globe. You know, we, in Kenya we are entrenched in battles of tribe against tribe without knowing that this, you know, this is not the globe. It's a village. That's why the others left us behind in South Korea and other places. They left us because they figured out this, this, this key, this miracle. Okay. While, while we were busy, you know, fighting each other in the village. So we must, this must change. You know. And so I I, 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 uh, I'm waiting to see what the future holds for the detente. Uh, like I said, uh, the proof of the pudding uh, will be in the eating, and we are going to see if Mr. Odinga will demand all those things. Uh, one of the things that I will advise him to do 
is to bring his three or two and a half principles. You know, two and a half principles with him to the, to the table. No, not, not I. I thank you. <laughs>